Captain Cousteau is waiting for his ship Calypso, now entering Monaco Harbor. On the brink of a major expedition, he readies himself to face the challenge of the sea's danger and mystery. The Calypso crew and I will be undertaking a series of voyages of exploration and discovery in all the seas of the world. We will endeavor to save magnificent creatures threatened with extinction. We will study the behavior of all forms of life that thrive in the sea. We will try to trace the history of the oceans in fossil rocks dating back millions of years. From cages made of plexiglass, we will film life that is sometimes serene, sometimes savage, and always beautiful. We will explore the graveyards of the sea where sunken ships slumber in search of scientific creatures more precious than shipwrecks gold. Each time we dive, each time we enter the sea, we learn something new. We have never been better equipped to observe, to learn, and to put our findings to scientific use. Over the years, our quest will lead us to confront the dangers and reveal the splendors of the sea. The shark is said to be a fearsome brute, but this is not always true. Many harmless species exist. Sand sharks, spotted dogfish, nurse and leopard sharks. But for a diver, a shark bite, whether accidental or deliberate, is always serious and sometimes fatal. Sharks have changed little in over 180 million years of evolution, and their oldest ancestors go back about 450 million years. But the great age of the life form does not mean that these superb creatures are primitive. Certain viviparous species even invented the placenta long before the appearance of mammals. When you are diving and meet a shark, what do you do? There is no definite answer to that question. There are many kinds of sharks, and each kind behaves very differently according to influences we know little about. Several rows of razor-sharp teeth provide them with a deadly weapon. This tooth, for example, belonged to 
a very large, dangerous shark of a species still living today. But much larger similar teeth are to be found in sedimentary layers. They are fossil teeth from huge sharks extinct since many million years ago. Divers, in their nightmares, may dream about such monsters looking probably like this model. In Monaco Harbor, the Calypso is ready to cast off. Captain Cousteau will lead her around the world on a voyage of discovery. The men and gear are on board. Monaco's royal family contributes the last crew member, Zoom, the dog who will become Calypso's mascot. The Odyssey begins as sea voyages have always begun with a contagious sense of excitement and fanfare. But this is a modern odyssey, a five-year exploration of the undersea world, man's last frontier. Calypso will sail from the Mediterranean to the Red Sea, then around Africa, across the Atlantic to South America, and into the Pacific via the Panama Canal. March 10th, Calypso is heading for a small island in the Red Sea where we hope to find sharks. Okay. For all her 400 tons, the ship carries only 28 men. Each must be an expert in more than one field. Divers like Bernard Mestre and Roger Chopin double as photographers and mechanics. Other divers are engineers, marine biologists, archaeologists, or navigators, who have few rules and no uniforms, only the red cap, the traditional hat for hard hat divers. Each dive is planned in advance so that the film director, Philippe Cousteau, and the head diver, Canoe, can coordinate the shooting. The divers are experienced but young because of the stamina needed to sustain prolonged journeys beneath the sea. The Calypso divers will be using gear specially designed by the Cousteau team. It features a streamlined casing, headlamps for night diving, chest-mounted pressure regulator to facilitate breathing during underwater work, and radio sonar telephone systems enabling communication between divers and with the Calypso. Serge Foulon is wearing the 85-pound aqualung invented by Cousteau, which really opened the world of the deep to humanity. These divers have spent thousands of hours underwater. Nevertheless, in shark country, they all feel a twinge of apprehension. A new device gets the divers into the water, the chute. Last down the chute is cameraman Philippe 
Cousteau. We have begun our search for sharks. We do not know yet where they will come from or what attracts them most. But we are assuming that fish in the process of feeding will create pressure waves that should soon attract shark. The divers have come as friends with Fou. And once the fish are sure they mean no danger, Fou and Ruiz are overrun by them. The white tip shark swimming here does not have a very good reputation. For safety, the divers have shark billies attached to their tanks. The defensive weapon will allow the men to keep the shark at bay. To avoid being attacked from the rear, Foulon and Ruiz form a back-to-back -back defense. With as few movements as possible to avoid arousing the shark's interest, they begin their climb back to the surface. A ticklish maneuver. Once they leave the ocean floor, they are vulnerable to attack from beneath. With the shark, nothing is predictable. It is a relief to see Foulon, Ruiz, and Philippe back on deck. We now know that this is the right place to mount our most crucial shark experiments. Aboard the Calypso at Cousteau's invitation is an authority on sharks, Dr. Eugenie Clark, an ichthyologist founder of Florida's Cape Hayes Marina Laboratory. She has come to observe and to experiment with sharks in the open sea. Recently, we have met a white tip uh, albinarginatus that was at least 13 feet long. I think it's rare. Yes. And you say even the little ones are aggressive. Yes, more than the big ones. You know, dashing from one point to the other at tremendous speed. Philippe had quite a specialty, to find himself with a shark under each arm, a one. <laughs> now, people say, oh, it's a small shark because the shark is about that big. A shark that big can take a mouthful bigger than any big dog. Even and and people are, are like afraid a... of dogs that big, and they can take uh, almost nothing. A shark the same size can take a, a, a pound of meat. March 25th. Experiments begin. Most specialists agree that sharks are attracted by blood. But if there is no blood, what signals an alien presence to them? Sight, sound, or smell?
Don't worry about this mutilated diver, it's just Arthur, an experimental dummy. To learn why the shark attacks, we started with Arthur fully equipped and stuffed with rags. He looks like a diver, but he lacks one thing. As sight has not motivated an attack, we will test scent. This time, we have stuffed Arthur with fish. But the animal is always cautious. His brain analyzes all the factors that must be present before he acts. Warily, he stalks Arthur. Once he is sure that his victim cannot escape, he makes up his mind. Quick as lightning, he tears off a leg. It's time to bring Arthur back to the surface. In a second, there will be nothing left. This instinctive caution combined with deadly efficiency have maintained the survival of the species for many million years. Today, we begin one of our most important assignments, to trace the migrations of various shark species. Are they sedentary, or do they travel from island to island, or ocean to ocean across great distances? In location over a reef, the divers will attempt to mark a wide variety of shark for later identification and migration observation. Head diver Canoe makes the tag team assignments. Ruiz will do the tagging, guarded by Foulon, while Philippe will film. It is vital that the tag be placed at a specific spot that will not injure the shark or impair its movements. Such a target area is at the base of the dorsal fin. C'est là que ça tient le mieux. Alors, Canoë, montrez-nous euh, quels sont les dispositifs de marquage qu'on a à bord. Depending on the circumstances, the divers will use a long spear or a short dagger to mark the shark. Barbed hooks with a red plastic tag attached will be placed in the hollow end of the spear. The detachable point must penetrate the shark's tough skin, reinforced by a multitude of tiny teeth. The red tags give date and location and bear requests that when found, they be returned to Cousteau's headquarters in Monaco. The divers will be working near the surface during tagging and therefore will be most vulnerable. They have been provided with special anti-shark cages to which they can retreat in case of danger. The blue whaler is one of the most beautiful sharks. He follows schools of whales, culling the sick, the young, and the defenseless. In the sea-diffused afternoon sunlight, a bullfight-like ritual has begun. One after another, sharks of different species pass back and forth while a man searches for the right moment to place his banderillo. It is a corrida without cape or kill, but the diver Toreador 
needs the same mastery over himself and his fear. At night, the foredeck becomes a movie theater. It shows films taken by the Calypso, rushed for processing, and then picked up at a prearranged port. A giant grouper, weighing perhaps 250 pounds, was photographed by Calypso divers exploring a shipwreck. The grouper was surrounded by hundreds of tiny pilot fish, a startling sight, for it had long been thought that pilot fish swim only with sharks. the Calypso team proved that they also followed divers. Pilot fish were even found swimming for days in front of the Calypso. The myth of the pilot fish originated in antiquity. It was believed that they led the sharks to their prey and in return were protected by their powerful master. A good story, but not true. The pilot fish actually feed on the scraps of the shark's meal. They survive in his presence because they are too agile for him to catch, or perhaps too insignificant for him to bother. July the 10th, the heat in the Red Sea has been reaching 105 degrees during the day, but water conditions remain excellent for filming. Today, we will fish for sharks to check the effectiveness of our tagging operation. Foulon has noted that the tagged sharks are the bolder, more curious ones of the species, and therefore most likely to appear again. The boldness that brought the sharks close enough to be tagged will probably bring them in after bait. Splash and scent alert the creature. Ironically, this formidable eater does not need much food. He can live more than a month without eating. Without food, he will stop growing, but he will survive. The killer is fragile. His skeleton is made of cartilage. He has no bones, but mortally wounded, he may still swim for hours. The most important part of tagging will be the knowledge gained over a long period by the recovery of the tags. Number 014, just a minute. Three weeks ago, this was tagged three weeks ago, so that this shark is not swimming in the open ocean. He's living there around the reef. It's a yes. sedentary shark. I think it's very important to have food. It will take a great many tag recoveries to begin to understand the migrating patterns of sharks. It was on May 8 that we came upon a rare creature I had seen only once in 30 years at sea. A whale shark. And even this monster was marked with a Calypso tag. He is the largest of the shark. This one is 50 feet long and probably weighs 20 tons.
Despite his size, the whale shark is the gentlest of all sharks. The only food he will eat is plankton and small fish. brief appearance at the surface, he returns to his deep realm, still mysterious to us. August 20th, a month of sandstorms has clouded the water and made filming difficult. They have passed now, and we will return to shark-filled waters. Dr. Eugenie Clark is continuing her studies of shark sensory perception. For aquarium work, she has perfected an ingenious method that she is about to try in the open sea, assisted by the Calypso divers. The method combines panels bearing striped targets, bait, and an auditory signal, and is designed to evaluate the relative importance of the shark's senses of sight, smell, and sound. Off the Suakin Islands, the divers working with Dr. Clark, Foulon, Templier, and Dr. Francois are about to set up pairs of targets. One is vertically striped, the other horizontally. In some cases, the learning ability of sharks is believed to be comparable to that of a pet rat. If this is so, it should be possible to train them to come for food in response to visual clues. A fish is attached to the horizontally striped target. When the shark takes the bait, the diver triggers an auditory signal to show the shark that he chose the correct panel. The shark tends towards the vertically striped target, either for reasons of eye structure or because many fish display vertical stripes. After cautiously circling the vertically striped target, the shark finally takes his food from the target with horizontal stripes. After several weeks of training, the bait will be eliminated and the shark will continue to ask for food by hitting the horizontal target. Our pupil will have learned that horizontal stripes mean food. September the 12th. A giant cage topped by a plexiglass dome has been assembled by the engineers of the Calypso. The crew calls it the Squaloscope. It is a specially devised observation chamber for studying the effect of sedatives on sharks. An alien apparition, the squaloscope descends into a peaceful sea. Life will flow around it, through it. 
only the shark will be detained inside. Working as a team, Foulon and Canoë set their trap. A piece of fish on a long line is placed in front of the cage. Once the shark has grasped the bait, he is pulled into the cage. As soon as he is inside, Foulon will close a plexiglass door, locking the shark in the squaloscope. To study a living shark at close range, he must be drugged. The divers are going to perform the first underwater tests on a new tranquilizer that researchers use when marking bears and other large animals. MS-222 is injected into the gills with a giant syringe. Will the tranquilizer be effective? And for how long? It takes less than 30 seconds for the drug to act. The shark that Canoe affectionately calls Gargantua is momentarily tamed. The divers expected that baiting the cage again would attract other sharks and bring them into the trap with Gargantua. But to their surprise and dismay, a horde of sharks is attracted, probably because of distress waves emitted by the captive animals. For safety, the divers cling close to the squaloscope as the fury of the baited sharks increases. As for Gargantua, he returns to apparently normal behavior after 10 minutes. The new tranquilizer is effective and harmless. What really attracted the other shark? Pressure waves emitted by frantic sharks caught on hook an aluminum launch equipped with television cameras is lowered to provide minute-by-minute -minute observation. The TV camera is linked to a motion picture camera so that those manning the launch can observe as well as film the events. What will happen when a live fish bites the baited hook? Are the distress waves of a fish in danger enough to trigger a predator's attack. Because the shark's flanks and head are dotted with nerve endings, his whole body is a large antenna wired for the reception of infrasonic impulses, even from great distances. Our scientific trolling does not go on for long. A fish soon strikes at the bait, is caught, and flails helplessly, producing distress waves. Less than two minutes later, a shark appears, bites through the steel leader line, and makes off with his prize. The experiment is a graphic illustration of nature's way of recycling sick and dying animals. September 18th. Many myths have been dispelled. We are now sure that the shark sees well, possesses an acute sense of smell, and is extraordinarily well equipped to perceive certain vibrations. Normally, he hesitates to bite a creature whose behavior is unfamiliar to him. Nevertheless, there are hundreds of reports of sharks injuring swimmers. Now we will concentrate on the problem of protection from sharks. With a bait fish, Canoe makes a shark repellent sandwich. For years, it has been believed that the most effective repellent was copper acetate mixed with a strong dye. During World War II, a packet of shark chaser, like the one in Canoe's sandwich, was given to airmen who might be forced down at sea. It was good for morale, 
at best. But we must bow to facts. The shark gobbles down heartily the copper acetate sandwich supposed to keep him away. We will now test a protection device based on another idea, isolating the shipwreck victim from the marine environment. With Canaway armed with a rifle and keeping guard from a rubber dinghy, Philippe Cousteau tests the latest US Navy gadget, the inflatable plastic Johnson shark screen. It consists of a life ring attached to a large plastic bag that masks a man's scent and camouflages his body. Cousteau directs the operation as his son, holding onto a safety line, splashes the water to attract the shark. He knows the reputation of the device, but also knows that should the shark attack, plastic is no protection against his powerful thrust and tearing teeth. Cousteau orders Philippe taken aboard. The shark has come too close. With the divers standing by in case of emergency, Cousteau approves a broader test. Three men floating amidst sharks. Apparently, all the animal sees are dark, blurry objects with no limbs or feet to bite at, no familiar shapes, no human aroma. The Johnson screen thus seems to be the only acceptable shark protection system now available. October 8th, we have tracked the shark through the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden, and the Indian Ocean. One major experiment remains to be tried. Informal conferences are held at dinner. It is one of the few times when virtually all the crew is gathered in one place. On this night, the divers, Dr. Clark and Captain Cousteau, discuss the problems of diving after dark. The sharks must be observed during the night in order to complete the study of their behavior. When we put our powerful 750 watt lamps on, I think they're crazy, they just rush on the land. Once one shark gets up enough nerve to come in to something, it will, I think, excite the other sharks in the area and they'll join. Usually one shark starts first in a feeding frenzy, takes one bite, and something about uh, the success of this shark then causes other sharks to get excited and come in too. The divers will descend in the wee hours using strongly reinforced cages. Powerful lights mounted on them make night filming possible. At dawn, the harrowing experiment is still going on, drawing more and more sharks to the vicinity of the Calypso. From the TV monitor room of the ship, Cousteau supervises operations. Oui, oui. 
Using the underwater telephone, he maintains contact with the divers. The cage reaches the bottom. The spearing of a fish increases the agitation of all the creatures and lures an unexpected guest, a 200-pound grouper. The incident ignites the desired explosion, a full-blown frenzy of sharks in the sea. The divers keep the sharks swarming near the cage with handheld bait and continue marking. Once again, the boldest sharks are those that have already been tagged. The divers must drive them away to allow others to come close. The goal is to observe the feeding frenzy both underwater and on the monitors above. Is that one of the tag sharks now? Uh, this one, yes, sure. You see the label uh, below the dorsal fin. Uh, it's not unusual. We have tagged almost 120 sharks uh, since February. And uh, I think that in this area, about one out of three is already wearing a, a label on its so back. there's another one. But now, Dr. Clark is beginning to worry about the divers. Close to that, that, that one took the reflector. Hello, Serge. Est-ce que vous ne pensez pas que les requins deviennent un peu trop agressifs? À vous. Bon, compris. Compris. The sharks are getting too aggressive. No longer cautious, they even swim through the bars of the cages. Drunk, dizzy, they are overcome by a frenzy for blood and flesh. The situation is entirely too dangerous. The cages must be brought up. Hello, Serge, Serge. Je vous entends bien, je vous entends bien. Oui, oui, ça va. Nous allons vous remonter. Nous allons vous remonter tout de suite. Faites remonter les cages. Hein. Cousteau orders the cages brought up as quickly as possible. So ends our investigation of the shark. For more than six months, we have studied him and often felt endangered by him. Occasionally, he will haunt our dreams, but most of us have come to admire his power and grace. The shark is a splendid beast, one of the sea's most magnificent creatures. For the Calypso crew, the adventure has just begun. The sea holds much more than just cruel and gory scenes. There is incomparable beauty as well.
Captain Cousteau and his divers are now bound for new adventures. The next chapter in the Calypso log will be the Coral Jungle.